So for those of you who've been watching my channel for a while, I don't think it's a secret that I am a pagan and have been for quite some time. If you didn't, hi, I'm Emily and I am a pagan. Many of my friends IRL know this too, so last year when the film Midsommar by Ari Aster came out, a lot of them went, hey Emily, you're a pagan, right? You should watch Midsommar. <laughs> We just need to acclimate. I don't want to acclimate, I want to go. Absolutely not. And I was like, okay, maybe, because horror generally isn't my film genre of choice. And then I talked to some pagan friends of mine and their thoughts were mixed. Some liked it just fine, but some also really hated it. They said to me, it was offensive to pagans. This is not what pagans are like. Naturally, I wanted to form my own opinion and my desire to watch this film was solidified by Comic Book Girl 19, AKA Danica XIX. She had a glowing review of this film and if anyone can get me to read or watch anything, it's probably Danica. So I watched the film. Now, was I offended by the film's portrayal of paganism? Not exactly. But I will say that my feelings around the film are a little more complicated than whether I was offended or not. Midsommar is the story of Dani, who is grief-stricken after her parents and sister die in an act of murder-suicide. In the aftermath, she travels to Sweden with her emotionally unavailable boyfriend Christian and his friends, and they stay with a pagan commune called the Horgas, who are in the middle of their midsummer celebrations. During their stay, the Horgas ply Danny and her companions with psychedelics. They witness gruesome, ritualized human sacrifice along with other traditions of the Horgas. And one by one, Danny's group starts to go missing. Meanwhile, Danny becomes drawn to the Horgas and their communal way of life and begins to participate in their rituals and traditions. Eventually, the Horgas ask her to choose between Christian and one of their own as a human sacrifice, and she chooses Christian. The end. Now let's start with my overall thoughts on the film. I thought the film was visually stunning, it's very well shot. I loved how it was able to slip in subtle foreshadowings and symbolisms in the background. It is also one of the best portrayals of the psychedelic experience I have seen on film. Also, I thought the film was a great portrayal of cult indoctrination and how some groups prey on vulnerable and lonely people like Danny. That being said, I did have some problems with the film. I thought it had some massive pacing issues. And I also wasn't a fan of the character work. I thought everyone was quite thinly sketched. But another thing that really stood out to me was that the Horga commune didn't actually feel very pagan. Sure, there's midsummer celebrations, a maypole, a smattering of Elder Futhark runes in symbolically apt places, and there's also a scene of harvest offerings, but that all just feels like window dressing. Apart from these superficial elements, I didn't get a good sense of what the Horgas believed in spiritually. Their religious justification for their actions seemed vague and thrown together. In fact, their religion actually has some very Abrahamic features like a scripture. Are they polytheists or animists? I couldn't really tell. Sometimes there are very interesting pagan motifs in the film, like the disabled man who was deliberately inbred to be an oracle. Disabled people in Norse paganism were often considered enlightened or sacred, and they were often associated with gods like Odin, who became partially blind in his pursuit of knowledge. But even when this film introduces interesting pagan concepts, they are never addressed again and don't contribute meaningfully to the story. And above all, I found myself so weirded out by how obsessively group-focused the Horgas were. No one was an individual who added their own unique perspective to the community. They were always part of a hive mind that was completely in sync in their takedown of the main characters. This this is so different from my own heavily individualistic experience of paganism. Overall, I felt the Horgas looked pagan in appearance, but didn't feel pagan in essence. Now I'm going to make a disclaimer here. 
My take on paganism is very much shaped by my experiences with modern Western paganism. Of course, I can't presume to speak for all pagans. The world of paganism is vast and redonkulously diverse. To give you an idea of my lens into this film, I belong to two pagan paths. I am a Wiccan and a heathen. I'm also very involved with the London pagan community, so I know people from other paths as well, such as Druidry, and I know many who belong to a combination of several paths, such as myself. So that was my frame of reference when I was watching this film. So after I watched Midsommar, I was interested in other people's thoughts, and naturally I went on YouTube. I was really surprised at how many people thought this was an empowering narrative that glorified pagan ideals, including other pagans. Aster depicts the Harger clan as the precise answer to everything wrong with Danny's life. She's offered complete acceptance, genuine reciprocity, and total empathy. Thus, Midsummer is a shocking reassertion of the value of ritual. No matter how irrational these acts may seem, they have a very rational purpose, to build community and a sense of belonging. The Hargas, uh, since pagans are so into the life cycle and the yearly cycle, they have divided man's life into four different seasons, which I mean, this sounds really good to me, honestly. Like I was kind of like, I wanna join, like can I go join the Hargas? Like this kind of sounds really cool to me. And one of the things that I really respect about pagan culture, as opposed to our Western culture, is that they have a respect for death as a part of the life cycle. I really hope that she stays with them. I really hope that she, I would stay with them. I would fucking stay with the Hargas. I hope she stays with them. I hope her and Pele have many beautiful children. One of the other common themes is the idea that religion is absurd. In the movie, there's multiple kind of mentions of how outsiders in the community were unable to understand or comprehend what was really going on in the rituals. What's interesting about this movie though is instead of, you know, some white people going to some third world country, here you have them going to Sweden, another first world country, but still being unable to kind of understand or comprehend um, the bizarreness of their particular belief system. That community expresses the sort of mentality that just doesn't fit anymore in our modern societies. And this perspective is very important uh, to understand the entire movie. In this movie, it's not a question of being good or evil. It's about a clash of mentalities. And the traditions established by the community are their own reality. They compose a variety of values and beliefs that are seen as normal. And so they behave, accor behave accordingly to their religious beliefs and their old traditions. So they do not act to purposely cause harm. Now you could certainly argue that Midsommar is representing antiquated pagan practices rather than modern ones, and that it's trying to talk about the clashes between cultures, which is why many of these practices are shocking and brutal. We certainly do not have the same moral standards as our ancestors, and I do give credit to Ari Aster. He did do his research into ancient Swedish and Nordic traditions, and I can understand this when we're talking about the to stupa where the elders sacrificed themselves this apparently did happen but i do have a few issues with this as a blanket interpretation of the film first when you write off all the actions of the horgas in midsomar as simply antiquated and therefore fine for their way of life you're ignoring the fact that this film will still affect mainstream audiences view of modern paganism after all the horgas do have people operating in the modern world, going to university and such. They still seem perfectly capable of interacting with the modern world, so why should your mainstream audience automatically assume that their practices are ancient and out of date? This interpretation also dismisses the manipulative, predatory, and often downright sinister nature of the things the Horgas do to Danny and her companions. They gaslight Danny and use her past traumas to manipulate her into to staying when she wants to leave. They burned up no, in a I fire. Wasn't talking about that. My parents, they no. burned up in a fire. So believe me when I tell you, 
that I know what it's like because I do, I really, really do. They constantly ply her into submission with drugs. They overwhelm her with their performative niceness so that she can't question her environment. Not to mention, they straight up engineer the breaking point of her relationship with Christian. Let's talk about this for a bit. I'm not sure why so many people thought this was some empowering narrative about Danny's liberation from a toxic relationship despite her and her boyfriend being expertly manipulated by the Horgas. They're both plied with drugs the whole time and can't consent to anything that's happening to them. I think it's especially unfair when people say that Christian deserved his fiery death at the end. Mind you, he's an asshole. He throws his friend under the bus after stealing his thesis idea. He's evasive and emotionally checked out from his relationship with Danny. Well, I just apologize, Danny. You didn't apologize, you said sorry, which sounds more like too bad. Although to be fair, I understand this. When you're no longer in love anymore, it's hard to care. But I also did see him trying to stay emotionally present and invested. When he's unfaithful to her, if you can call it that, He's coerced. He has no agency. The Horkas deliberately impose drugs on him that make him submissive, so he can't consent to this sex ritual. If anything, he was sexually assaulted. And there's no denying that the Horkas wanted Danny to witness him in the act. They wanted her to hit her breaking point. Because once she broke down, they were able to bring her completely into the fold. It probably helps that she was under the influence and could think critically about the situation with all of these women in her face. So Danny is in no position to choose or to consent to anything done to her until the very end, and even then, is she? Would there really be no consequences if she chose a Horga to be sacrificed instead of Christian? It seems awfully like she's just exchanged one prison for another. The Horgas basically use all the techniques from the cult indoctrination handbook to lure Danny into their nets and keep her brainwashed and compliant. For a more detailed breakdown of the indoctrination techniques used in Midsommar, allow me to refer you to this excellent video by Acolytes of Horror. And so, what are you saying about the origins of modern paganism when you write these actions off as old and culturally different? Are you saying that a lot of pre-modern paganism used these manipulative techniques as well? Because if so, that doesn't reflect well on paganism either. I will say that the events of Midsommar did remind me of experiences I've had in real life. Not with paganism, though. Christianity. So, story time. About five years ago, I was part of an evangelical church. I joined at a time when my self-esteem was low, I felt really lost, and I thought religion was the way out. At first, I loved the sense of community I felt in this church. We ate meals together, we went to movies together. We didn't have Bible study groups, we had family groups. I have always felt held by a family. A real family. Other members of the congregation weren't just members, they were your brothers or your sisters. When I talked about God and prayed with other members of this church, I felt like I was getting closer to each of them. And I let myself be vulnerable with them because I felt they were all my friends. But then my feelings started to change. Worship started to feel overwhelming with church retreats that ran from 8 a.m. to 11 p.m. at night. I got the sense I was being constantly scrutinized with members constantly asking me about how my journey with Jesus was going. People often eavesdropped on my conversations. I would tell a sister something in confidence and five people would know about it because you're our sister. We care about how you're doing with your faith. I often felt guilt tripped about the validity of my beliefs. People would say to me, you need to stop thinking about all these other issues and think more about Jesus. You need to truly commit to Jesus as your number one. If you really believe in God, you wouldn't believe in evolution. All these pressures were unbelievably stressful, especially if you have low self-esteem like I did at the time. When I watched the Horga women crowd around Danny and echo her screams, I didn't see them empathizing with her. I saw them insinuating themselves into her personal issues, overwhelming her with a choreographed performance of empathy. I didn't feel comfort or catharsis from that moment. 
I was triggered. It reminded me of all those times that I was pushed into the middle of a prayer circle and 10 people would put their hands on me and pray long, elaborate prayers over me. I remembered the claustrophobia of so much non-consensual physical contact, but also giving into it because I was supposed to be getting closer to God. Right? Nowadays, as a pagan, I finally feel liberated by worship, not constrained by it. Even though I participate in group worship, I'm encouraged to tailor my beliefs to myself and my individual needs, not according to some group demands. Now, this is not to say that all Christian churches are cults or that pagans are never coercive or exploitative they can be. Sexual abuse was a huge issue during the neo-pagan revival, and sometimes it still happens today. But why do mostly pagans bear the brunt of this type of nefarious portrayal on film? We have evolved so much in the last few decades, and we are constantly having conversations about how to have healthier communities. And do we really want to ignore the Catholic Church's massive issue with systemic sexual abuse and its failure to address it? And I think Ari Aster wasn't really trying trying to target paganism in Midsommar. He was trying to use a pagan community to talk about the dangers of religious fundamentalists and cults and the horrors of the indoctrination process. But still, why use a pagan cult if other religions would do just as well or better? With this question in mind, I decided to contextualize Midsommar in its genre. So Midsommar is inspired by and is often lumped in with other films in the folk horror genre. The precise definition of this genre feels quite malleable, but as far as my research goes, your typical folk horror film features rural, natural landscapes, people of unconventional belief systems who reside in those landscapes, typically of the occult kind, and seeing as it's a horror film, these people's practices tend to be of the murderous nature. I went through listicles of films that inspired or are topically related to Midsommar, and I watched watched way more horror films than I thought I would in a short period of time. The films I focused on the most were notable works of folk horror such as The Wicker Man, Kill List, A Field in England, Apostle, The Blood on Satan's Claw, Wakewood, Pendus Fen, and Equus. Now keep in mind, the scope of my research was primarily focused on films featuring pagans or pagan-ish peoples rather than demon worshippers or satanists. Despite what Abrahamic rhetoric would have you believe, these are not the same types of practices and should not be conflated. I'm also not going to dwell a lot on horror films exclusively featuring witches. Witchcraft and paganism are also not the same thing and carry different sets of connotations. Of course, this is a really complicated topic because there is a large overlap between witches and pagans, and magic is an inherent part of pagan practice, but there are witches who don't consider themselves pagan, and vice versa. Now let's walk through some common trends in the horror genre's portrayal of paganism. In your typical pagan horror film, the pagans are isolated, whether by natural boundaries or restrictions set by your resident pagans. They have rules that apply only to their turf. In Don of the Londres thesis, about pagan representation in pop culture, he writes, Thus, it is as if the pagans lived in their own pocket dimension with rites and customs which are almost impossible to understand from the perspective of an outsider, especially if one is from the actual dominant faith who views paganism as something evil, which is the case in the original Wicker Man movie. If deities are featured in pagan horror, they are probably monstrous. They have quite basic and primitive aims, and they probably want to eat you. This is common all across the horror genre, like in The Chilling Adventures of Sabrina. The third season portrayed pagan deities as the primary antagonists and the Satanist coven as the good guys. Even on Supernatural, a show I loved until season six, 
pagan gods often have to be exterminated because they're attacking the locals. Oh, this is disappointing. I enjoy Supernatural, but that show is really not kind to pagans or witches. But that show does buy into a Christian theological worldview, so I guess that's not surprising. Of course, your pagan horror is not complete without human sacrifice. It's almost always wedged in one way or another. Because, of course, pagans are the ones who sacrifice their fellow man, it's not like Christianity is based on one significant human sacrifice or anything. I did also notice some more subtle trends in pagan portrayals in horror, and they parallel those in Midsommar. The culture and religion of the pagans in these films is often thinly sketched and simplistic. We rarely really understand their underlying spirituality or the ideology that motivates their actions. In Kill List, why do the pagans go through this charade of leading our protagonist to kill those closest to him? Doesn't matter. Why is resurrecting the newly dead significant to the people of Wakewood? I'm not sure. In Apostle, what values does this community believe in? They have a local goddess and they have a Bible, but what are its teachings, really? Not important. All you need to know is that they do blood sacrifice. It's also kind of funny because despite having a goddess, some of the commune members will still reference God, like the Abrahamic God. Ultimately, I often feel like the resident pagan cult is not as interesting as the conflict they create with the main protagonist. And I can understand this to an extent if a director is trying to tell a story that focuses on on the main character's personal conflict, there might not be room to flesh out the people around that character. Nonetheless, it's still frustrating when a scriptwriter just throws in a paganish cult and doesn't bother illustrating what's so special about them, why we should care about them. I still think The Wicker Man does the best job of laying out the local pagans' deities, their belief system, their motivations for their actions, while still telling an effective story about the clash of belief systems. Apart from the human sacrifice, they felt like a living, breathing community, not just some prop in a film meant to terrorize us. The Horgas in Midsummer do have concrete ideologies and customs, but as I said before, we still don't understand the religious aspects that motivate them. I think a really ironic aspect of many pagan portrayals in horror is that, like with Midsommar, many of them are portrayed as these mindless drones, large groups that over Become the individual. They have unquestioning religious fervor, singular in their desire to consume the main character to achieve their goals. In his 2017 article in The Guardian about folk horror, Michael Newton writes, In folk horror, the crowd destroys the individual. You are not up against some forlorn witch, but a cult. It is not the government that's out to get you, but your neighbors. You are going to be killed, but you cannot protest for it is the will of the people. The majority prevails." And this is deeply ironic because, as I said before, paganism has been such an individualistic experience for me. In my circles, no two pagans worship the exact same way or even believe the exact same things. So it's quite jarring for me to see pagans portrayed over and over again as these fanatical mobs with no individuality or humanity. Overall, I would say that the horror genre has largely paused where the Wicker Man left off, where portraying the pagan experience is concerned. By and large, the pagans of Summer Isle are given the most concrete and fleshed out of cultures, religions, and motivations. They have their gods and they have their traditions. They carry out murder, but it's to preserve their way of life. And it's difficult to find a film that takes this portrayal and expands on it in interesting and non-cliched ways. Now, it's not true that none of these films had unique takes on the pagan experience. I actually found a couple films quite different and refreshing. One of them was Pendus Fen, a 1974 BBC film made for television. Its main character, Stephen, is a closetly gay teen, and he takes out his sexual frustration by being an absolute self-righteous dick. Oh, can't you, mother? There's always somebody in them unnatural. I think he's unnatural himself. 
That's why he and his wife haven't been blessed with children. But then he begins to have visitations from various spiritual beings like angels, demons, and ghosts. Eventually, he connects with his country's pagan past and reaches spiritual enlightenment. He accepts his sexuality and rejects his peers' toxic masculinity. Another film I really loved was Equus, about a psychiatrist named Martin Dysart. He is asked to treat Alan Strang, a teenager who has developed a pathological religious worship of horses. Through treating Alan and observing his spiritual passion, Martin begins to experience an existential crisis. He reflects on his own clinical and passionless life, and he questions whether forcing Alan to conform to societal expectations is actually depriving him of what defines him. He's created his own desperate ceremony just, just to just to ignite one flame of original ecstasy in, in the spiritless waste around him. He's destroyed for it. Horribly. One thing I know for sure, that boy has known a, a passion more ferocious than I have known in any second of my life. Well, let me tell you something. I envy it. Don't you see? That's what his stare has been saying to me all this time. At least I galloped. When did you? Now, these films are not perfect productions. Pendus Fen in particular is quite dated and isn't very accessible if you're not cognizant of the cultural politics of 1970s England. But I loved that these films focused on the horror of the individual spiritual and religious experience. To me, this is a much better representative of pagan spirituality, where people follow their own spiritual revelations rather than conforming to a group mantra even if they do participate in group worship. And really, that is consistent to how paganism has always been. Before the days of Abraham, Abrahamic religions, these faiths were always evolving according to the needs of their individual worshippers. Despite these rare films, most pagan horror is not interested in exploring pagan ideas. Rather, they just use pagans as narrative devices. At best, they use pagans to initiate some elaborate thematic discussion. And at worst, they superficially use negative stereotypes of pagans to add horror elements and shock value to the film. You might say me, Emily, don't get so offended. Don't take it so personally. These storytellers are just trying to make a point. Well, imagine every time Christians were portrayed on screen, it was as a Mormon polygamous cult or the Westboro Baptist Church. Now, I don't necessarily dislike all of these films. I loved The Wicker Man, and I liked Midsommar just fine. And I also know that other pagans enjoy these films as well. But for me, having seen pagans portrayed the same way over and over again, I think the trope of the hive mind pagan cult is tired, stale, and overdone. The trope also feels bizarrely outdated to me because paganism has been a fast-growing religion in the Western world in the last few decades. In 1973, Iceland officially recognized recognized Asatru, which is the worship of Norse gods, and Greece officially recognized the worship of Olympian gods in 2006. You would think that mainstream views of pagans would have evolved a lot more by now, but based on a lot of Western media, they haven't. I did some digging to investigate why this is, and I have a few theories. First of all, the Western world is still predominantly shaped by Judeo-Christian beliefs, so pagans and their practices are still often often stereotyped as strange or evil. Even now, there is apprehension about paganism from those in mainstream faiths. For instance, in 2015, Scottish evangelists claimed that the growth of paganism was one of the greatest threats to civilization. And to this day, pagans are still fired from their jobs for their faith. And naturally, the horror genre tends to demonize what the mainstream is afraid of or doesn't understand. So if pagans are marginalized in mainstream culture, then yes, they will be the antagonists of our horror films. This was probably not at all surprising in the 1970s when folk horror was a budding genre. The new pagan revival really hit its stride around this time, and it was part of the massive countercultural wave that defined this decade. 
Unfortunately, along with counterculture came many cults that were extremely harmful and occasionally really were murderous, like the Manson family. As such, films like The Wicker Man illustrated the fear of how conventional beliefs could be challenged, while The Blood on Satan's Claw explored how dangerous and harmful cults like the Manson family could be, especially when they take hold in the young and impressionable. But paganism has changed and grown so much since the 1970s and yet how horror sees these religions hasn't. I would argue that Kill List is a regression of this image, while Midsommar doesn't really push the boundary that the Wicker Man has set. I would wager that this is partially due to the lack of information about pagans that still persists in the mainstream, to the point where some don't even believe that pagan faiths are legitimate religions. I'll give you an example. When I first told my dad that I was pagan, he he said to me, but I thought being pagan was the opposite of having a religion. Even now, most people who study pagans are pagans themselves. Pagans in general just don't communicate with non-pagans about their ways, uh, probably to avoid discrimination. And it's so easy to be a closet pagan, so we just blend in with everyone else. In a way, we are isolated amongst ourselves. So, of course, we're portrayed as isolated on film. Another thing is that pagan faiths are very diverse and, as I said before, individualized. We don't have one central body to speak for all of us or decide what we should all believe. Someone once asked me, so who decides what's right for you guys? The short answer is, we all do. Small pockets of us come to a general consensus about what we believe, and sometimes these beliefs propagate to the majority of pagans. And this is how many pagan religions have evolved over time, even in the pre-modern age. So given that pagans tend to keep to themselves and generally don't have a united set of beliefs, it's understandable that a filmmaker might make up a random cult with any manner of random beliefs and market them as pagan. Most of the time, there's no one to get offended on our behalf, and most of their audience doesn't even think we're real. I'm not saying that film Filmmakers should never make films with murderous pagan cults ever again. I'm in no position to dictate how art should or shouldn't be made. But the more you represent pagans a certain way, the more pop culture subconsciously thinks that of us. Now I get that in a horror film, you have to be scared of something. And I don't even really mind the portrayal of pagans as strange or scary. We can be kind of weird. A lot of us like wandering in the woods, collecting sticks, and sometimes we chant at the moon. But I am proposing that we progress pagan representation in the horror genre. Make more horror films that probe the pagan experience in new and interesting ways, like Pendus Fen or Echos. Make horror films about individuals coping with their spiritual experiences, spiritual enlightenment, is scary. Hell, make horror films where the pagans are main characters and the scary cults are Christian. But more importantly, treat pagans like we're real people. We are not just a horror movie device. We belong to faiths like any other. We are everywhere and we are real, and it would be great if art reflected that. Thank you so much for watching this video. It was an absolute labor of love. Comment down below with your perspectives, whether you are pagan or whatever. Uh, the pagan world is vast, and I know I am just one voice. Articles, films, and videos that I referenced are in the description below. Subscribe to my channel if you liked this video and want more of my rants about books and film. And I will see you in my next one.